Uh, picking up Sonnet 93. Um, Ninety-three and ninety-four are, I think at least, um, and as it suggested this, kind of companion pieces. You, you got to read those two together. They're they are also like uh, there's another set, and I can't remember where they are. Um, anyways. 93, and I'm going to do these two rather, I do have 94, right? Yeah, rather quickly. <clears throat> now, the other day I talked about, talking about the relationships. So you have the speaker, golden-haired youth, dark lady. You got this relationship, this relationship, this relationship. Okay, and they get kind of messy. Somewhere between, or in, let's say, one through one hundred and twenty-six, um, it's it's pretty clear that the dark lady is alluded to, or at least another love, however you want to define that. Okay, platonic, whatever. Um, there's another friendship or relationship in between these two, okay? There's also some kind of separation or distance that gets created between them. It's not exactly clear why. And we, we saw that beginning with Sonnet 73, that time of year thou mayest be, me behold, because the speaker says, you're going to have to leave me soon. And it's like, I'm dying to you. Okay? So 93. So shall I live, supposing thou art true, like a deceived husband. Heather, why did you cut that? <laughs> Almost looked like you were going to gag there for a moment. What's the speaker telling us? I'm going to keep living how? That's one way of putting it. It's, it's accurate. Pretending. Is accurate? Exactly. Pretending that you're still true, faithful to me. What? Like a deceived husband. Wow. <laughs> so love's face may still seem love to me, though altered new. Speakers just told us why. He's going to act like I don't know what's going on. Thy looks with me, thy heart in other place. As long as you're still looking at me, I don't care about whatever else happens. Notice that there should be a resonance between this and some of what the wife of Beth says in her tale, not in the prologue, in the tale. Okay? You can have me lovely and young, but you won't know who else I'm playing around with. Speaker goes on. So thy looks with me, thy heart in other place. The other place, obviously, with the the other what? <laughs> the dark lady, another poet, uh, we don't know, but somewhere else. For there can live no hatred in thine eye. Meaning, in your eye, hatred cannot exist. Why not? This person's eye emblematizes love. Whatever this person looks at, the person being addressed, not the person speaking. Whatever this person looks at, there's love there. Okay? Remember Sonnet 20? The one about gilding. The gilding? Exactly. Okay? Therefore, in that, in that, what? In your eyes. I cannot know thy change. I can look you deeply in the eyes and the speaker says, 
I can't tell if you're lying to me. In many looks, the false heart's history is writ in moods and frowns and wrinkles strange. Notice how that line reads. It's both lines all together, no market punctuation, no slowing down. So in many people's looks, what? The unfaithful heart is revealed. How? Moods, frowns, wrinkles. If you've read Hamlet, Hamlet tells his mother when she asks, why is your father's death so particular with thee? He says, particular? Nay, mother, tis. And he goes on and talks about all the turmoil inside. But he says, outwardly, we can put on all kinds of masks and costumes. But heaven in thy creation did decree that in thy sweet face, that in thy face sweet love should ever dwell. Someone looks at this person and it's just love. <laughs> that love is embodied. Okay? Whatever thy thoughts or thy heart's workings be, thy look should nothing thence but sweetness tell. Notice, the speaker knows. What's going on inside, that's different. But what one sees on the outside it's always truth and honesty and love and loyalty, etc. And then you get, and this is what Shakespeare is, I think, so genius at, is these concluding couplets. How like Eve's apple doth thy beauty grow if thy sweet virtue answers not thy show? Your beauty is like what? Eve's apple, meaning that leads to sin. It's not just temptation, it's the biting of the apple. How like Eve's apple doth thy beauty show? The beauty is what? The beauty is the temptation. Okay? Your beauty will be like Eve's apple if what? And by the way, those sonnet sequences that I mentioned the other day, Astro, Phil, and Stella, and Amoretti, they are largely about not just the speaker's loves, but virtue. Most of the sonnet sequences during the Elizabethan period, the idolized beauty, the idealized beauty, is a model of virtue in, in all of its contexts. Truth, honesty, justice, Beauty, real love, all those things, okay? Your beauty will be like Eve's apple, meaning leading one to sin, unless what? Unless you basically get your virtue up for your beauty. Unless in here you are really virtuous. It's the idea I've mentioned before. The platonic notion that beauty on the outside means beauty on the inside, okay? But Shakespeare's not saying that. He's saying the opposite. Why? Because this is probably Shakespeare's favorite theme. The appearance versus the reality. The appearance is what? Beautiful, true, faithful, but, so shall I live, supposing thou art true, like a deceived husband. Speaker's telling us what? The person being addressed isn't true. You can be true, though. How? Show, demonstrate the virtue that is, and I think it's implied, professed. Okay? Okay. The beauty on the outside, beauty can hide all kinds of things. And in another part tied into this, Shakespeare really loves to play with is artificial beauty, cosmetic. Paint is what it's referred to in the Renaissance. Painted faces. You may not be born beautiful, but you can sure as hell make yourself beautiful with enough makeup and such.
Okay? Go from there to 94. Oh, good. <laughs> like name the author or something like that, or it was like they gave us like a big section of it, and then it was like based on this, what was the whole poem about? Ah, um, and then something about uh, based on Esther Phil's tone in the poem, how to be like still a tough fellow or something. And is Stella supposed to be like um, she's reading like fanciful literature as opposed to realistic or more serious work? Because that's what that section of the poem was about. And apparently that was the correct answer. I don't know. I can go back to I that. don't remember. Anyway. I don't I, I remember Stella reading letters, but I don't remember reading a particular genre of literature, so to speak. Ninety-four. They that have power to hurt and will do none, that do not do the thing they most do show, who, moving others, are themselves as stone, unmoved, cold, into temptation slow. No. We can spend literally the rest of the entire period just unpacking those four lines. Because there's all kinds of Aristotelian thought, first mover, prime mover, all that kind of stuff. So they that have power to hurt and will do none, that is, and won't do any hurt, that do not do the thing they most do show. And you've got a gloss down at the bottom. It's not entirely clear what this thing is, but it probably relates to romantic or sexual activity. Though they inspire love, they do not reciprocate. Possible paraphrase. They do not do the thing they most do show. The most do show, that's this. The speaker is suggesting, you can kill me with your looks. That's a Petrarchan image. That's a Petrarchan convention. But... The person doesn't. The, the beloved doesn't do that. Notice, they don't do the things they most do show, the things that their face reveals, like love, for example. Who, moving others, that is, the person being dressed, their show moves others. Remember Sonnet 20? A man in hue, all hues controlling that's the moving. Okay? I'm not saying this is the dress to the golden-haired youth. I'm just saying that's a line that kind of helps inform this. Moving others are themselves as stone. Their beauty attracts like a magnet. But the people with this kind of beauty or this individual that's being addressed doesn't do what? Doesn't move doesn't demonstrate or show or act out love kind of in reciprocation. So draws people, but you know, is kind of, kind of totally oblivious in terms of showing love. Unmoved, cold, into temptation, slow. Meaning not drawn to temptation. You've got a gloss, slow to respond to really. Not a helpful gloss. To temptation slow doesn't just mean slowly drawn. It means not drawn. It's almost like to teeth. Okay? They, these kinds of people, rightly do inhabit, excuse me, inherit heaven's graces and husband nature's riches from expense. Husband doesn't just mean conserve. It means manage. Animal, the, the, the science of animal husbandry is managing flocks and herds and different kinds of animals and such, producing better ones through genetic engineering and all that kind of stuff. They are the lords and owners of their faces. That is, they control how they look. Okay? Others but stewards of their excellence. Other people, the speaker is suggesting, not the ones kind of being discussed, other people are merely stewards. They're not the owners of their faces. They, they kind of control, but they don't totally control. So every now and then there might be a glance given or a wink given. That's 
accidental. What can that glance or wink do for another person? It could be a sign, right? Teenage boys, you know, often if they've got an interest in somebody, just a mere glance or a mere smile will be enough to send them over the edge. Well, that's Petrarch does all of that stuff in his sonnets. The summer, what? Why are we talking about flowers now? Talk about a huge shift. The summer's flower is to the summer sweet, though to itself it only live and die. That is, it sweetens, it beautifies, to use a Hamlet phrase, the summer. But in and of itself, that flower is nothing. It'll just live shortly and then die. But if that flower with base infection meet, the basest weed outbraves his dignity. The basest weed does what? Overcomes the flower. Destroys the flower. You've got a gloss there, you know. I'm afraid to look at it. The most common weed will outshine a lovely flower that has been infected by disease. Okay? For sweetest things turn sourest by their deeds. See the connection with 93? Lilies, I love this line, this line. Just lilies that fester smell far worse than weed. Why lilies? Why not roses? Because lilies symbolize death, usually. No. Almost the exact opposite. Lilies symbolize purity. And if something is pure, and it festers. Festering implies what? Where's the rot? It's on the inside. Okay. Um, I've got them on the syllabus, 97 and 98, okay? They're companion pieces too. Not, they're not companion to 93 and 94. That is, you don't have to read 97 and 98 as being continuation. But 97 and 98 are about the same thing. This. We've been distant. We've been separate, okay? Okay? How like a winter hath my absence been from thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year. Notice, the thee is the pleasure of the fleeting year. The year goes by quickly. My presence with you, that's what brings me pleasure as the year goes by. Okay? Go to 98. From you have I been absent in the spring, when proud pied April, dressed in all his trim, hath put a spirit of youth in everything, that heavy Saturn laughed and leaped with him. Okay. I've been absent from you in the spring. And then what does he talk about with spring? Blooming. Proud pied April. Pied means variegated in color. Okay. Yet nor the lays of birds, the songs of the birds, nor the sweet smell of different flowers and odor and in hue could make me any summer's story tell, that is, count, to describe, to tell over, or from their proud lap pluck them where they grew, that is, the ground, where the flowers grew and such. Nor did I wonder at the lily's white, there's the lily again, nor praise the deep vermilion in the rose. They were but sweet, but figures of delight. So if they're figures of delight, then what aren't they? They aren't the actual delight. They're images, okay? Drawn after you, you pattern of all those. What's the speaker just said about the person being addressed? The person is the actual delight. Let's use the platonic imagery. The person is the form of beauty, sweetness, delight. So if the person is the form, again, you know, platonic language, stuff we've seen before, you shine a light behind that, what does that create? A shadow of 
an image of sweetness, delight, beauty, etc. So these other images, the lily, the rose, etc., these are images, figures of delight drawn after you. These are the shadows of you. Yet seemed it winter still and you away, and with your shadow I with these did play. Mm, what's the speaker just said? That he uh, uh, sort of forced or relegated to fancy and the imitations of the sort of ideal lust and perfection. Okay. Things away from, uh, I'm assuming, the youth. You're mostly there. Let me ask, de intellectualize it a little bit. Bring it down to earth. What's the speaker saying? You were away, so? Elvin or Stephen Bishop, 1970s, had a song. If you can't love the one you want, anybody know the rest of the lyric? Love the one you're with. Whoever the person being addressed is, is gone. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be without pleasure. So if I can't have the lily, you know, the sunflower is not bad. The poppy isn't bad. Uh, pick your flower. But they're what? Oh, honey. They're just images of you. What's the speaker trying to say? No, these weren't serious flings. They were just, really, they were just images of you. So really, my love was directed at you. Yeah, you think that's going to fly? You get caught. You know, you're married, you get caught in an affair. No, it, it wasn't really her that I was attracted to, honey. It was, she was in the image of you. If I tried that on my wife, boom. Okay, <laughs> six feet of ground is what I would inherit. All right? Those two, 97 and 98, are very, very similar. Go through and read 97. Because um, I'm one, I'm, going to try to get through as many of these as possible. Go to 116. We might come back. I think I have. It. Yeah. We might come back to 106. But 116 I'm probably going to spend a little bit more time on. I just love this poem. It's usually also included in the 100 best love poems. And this is much more of a love poem than, <clears throat> um, you know, the last two poems I have on the syllabus. To the virgins to make much of time and to his coy mistress. Those are both carpe diem poems. Seize the day. In another class that I'm teaching, Intro to Lit or Appreciation to Lit, whatever it's called, the textbook includes those two under four uh, tone and style in four love poems. Those are not love poems. They are not love poems at all. The first one, yeah, maybe kind of. The second one's about sex, pure and simple. And it has, and I'll tell you right now, it has one of the most disgusting images ever in the English language. Which one? Uh, which one? I want to look that up quickly. Um, to a square mistress, okay? More disgusting for women than it is for men. I'll just warn you right now. So. 116, and I'm going to make it, hold on one second, let me just see, 979, is that, I think this book glosses it now, the word that I'm thinking of that is used, no it doesn't. So I'm going to have to gloss a word that ought to be glossed. And it is a modern slang word for a sexual organ that is, goes back to Chaucer, actually. 
or used in Chaucer. Sonnet 116. This is not that kind of poem. Just listen to this first. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, whose worth's unknown although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever moved. Okay? Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit immet impediments. Notice what is being married. Minds. minds. John Milton, this is published 1609. John Milton, about 40 or so years after this, writes a pamphlet, a little book, called the Doctrine on the Doctrine and Discipline of Divorce. Okay? Milton is considered one of the great Puritans. Puritans are pretty much against divorce. Milton and his wife did not get along. They hated each other. Oh. And he's writing for the justification that I can get rid of this old hag. Okay? Um, and he uses, not this line from Shakespeare, but he uses the meaning of this line. Milton argues, if there is not a union of the minds, you will not have any other kind of union. And a dissolution of intellectual union means the divorce has already occurred. Whether one gets a church or state divorce, that's irrelevant. The two have already separate. Where the two became one, already rent asunder, to use the biblical language. So let me not, to the marriage of true minds, admit hmm, impediments. What's an impediment? It's something that stops you from walking. Okay? So the implication here is the marriage means what? A drawing together. Let me stop the coming together. Let me not stop, excuse me. Let me not stop the coming together of these two minds. It's probably an illusion. You've got a gloss. I think it mentions it. Yeah, the marriage service in the Book of Common Prayer. This is a reference to the bands. If any of you know cause or just impediment, why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, ye are to declare it. In Shakespeare's day, the bands were read B-A-N-N-S the bands were read over three consecutive Sundays prior to the wedding day of a couple. For Shakespeare, the bands were only read once. We know. Why? Because Anne was six months pregnant. And they didn't get married in Warwickshire. They got married in a county, I think, next to Warwickshire. Okay? So, Marriage of True Minds. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. What does that mean? You've got a gloss, 14, remover, one who changes or ceases to love. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. This is one of the reasons why this is one of the greatest love poems. Love doesn't cease even when you stop being loved by someone else. Bingo. Okay. And you can understand why people, I don't know that if it's still done, I know it was happening in the 70s, in California at least, would use this as part of their wedding vows. Because that sounds like what? No matter what happens. Okay? If the love alters when it finds alteration. So, let's say husband, wife. I'll put the onus on the guy. Girlfriend. 
Husband and wife are married. Husband falls for girlfriend. According to these lines, wife doesn't what? Wife doesn't stop loving husband. Notice, it finds alteration here, but it doesn't do what? It doesn't alter. Wife still loves husband. 21st century, most people would say, well, they're pretty damn stupid. Did this also be like a pun on the word also, like the, like the also in the church? Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't think so. Because you, there would be have to be something in the lines that indicate that kind of physical alter. And it's pretty clear this is the verb rather than the noun. Love is not love which alters when an alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. So if husband goes and cheats, on girl, cheats with girlfriend, and wife discovers that, and wife says, well, yeah, with you, I'm out of here. What does the line mean? Really. That wasn't really love. What she's saying is we weren't really, or I didn't really love you. Notice it doesn't say anything about the, alter, the one who's doing the alteration at the beginning. That's, that's out of the picture. Why? Because I can't control, the bring it personal, I can't control what my wife does. I like to think I can at times, but it doesn't happen that way. What can I control? That's another idea that we kind of lost track of, in, I think, in the 21st century, that we become mere victims to everything of fate rather than I can control things. So, or bids of the remover to remove, that is the other half of the couple. Oh, no. It is an ever-fixed mark. Ever-fixed. It is a permanent point, reference point. All right? That looks on tempests and is never shaken. Well, where are tempests? Where do tempests occur? Shakespeare's very last play, The Tempest. At the sea, in the sky, storms. So if it looks on tempests and isn't shaken, where is it? It's not in the midst of those tempests. Love is something out here. It looks down on these things. Okay? It is the star, and then the speaker makes clear, it's the star to every wandering bark, whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Like saying for a navigator in the northern hemisphere, love is like Polaris, the North Star. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it's like the Southern Cross. There is no, I don't know what the word means. Would, word would be. There is no southern star for Earth. If you're in the southern hemisphere and you can find the constellation, the Southern Cross, you can navigate by that. Okay? So what does he mean? Notice, it's the star to every wandering bark. Bark just meaning boat. If you're on the sea and you're being beaten about by the tempests, if you can find that star... You can do what? You can navigate. You can figure out where you are. Its height to be taken, where it is, on the degrees of the horizon, will tell you how far north you are. Farther south you go, the higher up Polaris goes. Just the opposite. Farther north you go, the higher up Polaris goes, because when you get true north, you look straight up, and there's the North Star. Farther close, closer to the equator, the lower on the horizon it goes. So, love's not time's fool. The rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. What does that mean, time's fool? Age? Fool means all that. It also means plaything, toy. Okay? We think time, it's 
some people think. Time just plays tricks with us, plays games with us, right? Things are going really great, and that time seems to go by quickly. And then life sucks, and time slows down like it's never going to stop, okay? Love's not time's fool, though within the rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. What's the bending sickle's compass? Because time is portraying the Grim Reaper. He's got his sickle. If you've ever seen or watched how a sickle is used or used one, you do this and you make a circle. You make an arc. You walk and you do this. Okay? And it cuts an arc. So what are love's rosy lips and cheeks? It's probably an indicator of sex, by the way. We don't usually describe men as having rosy lips and cheeks. That's more women. Notice the speaker is saying, within our time, within the circle of our times, here's the circle of my time, let's say, here's the circle of my wife's time. Within each of those times, what happens? Well, other people come in, go out, we meet, we dismeet, we fall away from friends, etc. That's, that's all that's talking about. The speaker is, I think, speaking from an obviously male perspective. You know, other women come into your orbit, so to speak, or come into your sphere of influence. But love isn't dictated by what? By that, by time, by their coming in and out. Love alters not with his... What's his? Love. Nope. Time. Times. With times, brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. Honey, I want a divorce. I've fallen out of love with you. What does that kind of imply? The time is done. The time for our love is finished, and it's time for me to start a new love, so to speak. Speaker says, Nope. Love does what? Look at the verb. Bears it out. Even to the edge of doom. Why bears? What does that verb imply? Burden. It's a burden. It's hard. Okay. It's not love enjoys it out. Or... You know, think of a verb that implies joy. I can't think of one off the top of my head. You know, in, I can't, still can't think of one. It bears it out even to the edge of doom. What's the edge of doom? Death, judgment day. Okay. Now, and I, I very, very seldom do this. Think of this poem, possibly... Biographically, that is Shakespeare. 1585, for all we know, Shakespeare leaves Stratford on Avon. He's been married for three years, two years. Leaves his wife with three young children. Goes to by 1590 or so, he's in London. He stays in London. For all we know, apparently, most of the time, 1590, 1592 to 1611, 1612. What's it say for this poem? Is, he, is this Shakespeare's way of telling Anne, his wife, you know, I still love you. I might be, maybe it's not the remover and the alteration. Maybe that's not this. Maybe that's this. 
Maybe the alteration in the remover is, I can't be here, I have to be here. How many divorces occur because someone's job takes them away? My in-laws got divorced because my father-in-law, before I knew them, father-in-law worked for Social Security, got transferred, was supposed to be temporary, six months, was going to then move back to where he lived, job he was going to move back to where he lived, got filled by somebody else, and what was temporary, 500 miles away, suddenly became permanent. How do you have a family when that's the case, you know? That could be what is being talked about here. If this be error and upon me prove, that means what? If I'm wrong and you prove it to me, I never writ, nor no man ever lewd. Notice what Shakespeare has done with that final couplet. What's the conundrum? What's the paradox that he creates? Well, he did writ, right? Because <laughs> we're reading what he writ. That's his way of saying, gotcha. You'll never prove me wrong. You'll never prove me wrong. This, in one sense, okay, I think, my opinion, you don't have to agree with this by any means, this is one of the greatest expositions, explanations of ideal love. No matter what the other person does or has to do, the, the person who is speaking says, I will always love you. Till the end. Till the end. Interestingly, in his will, Shakespeare left his wife the second best bed. And it's puzzled people ever since the will was read. Like, Really? Why don't you give her the first best bed? And it's been argued the second best bed was the best bed in the house, in the house reserved for guests. The marriage bed has been kind of worn out because that's what they sleep in all the time. The second best bed is the one with the fairly new mattress because not many people have been coming in staying. That's one way it's been read. I don't remember others. <clears throat> most yeah, should I say most? Could just be an inside joke. Could be some kind of inside joke that Anne will get, you know. Um, you know, interestingly, interestingly, his will does not mention any books. And we know Shakespeare had to have read. Because some of his sources for the plays were only available in books. In, in books in French, in Latin, for example. Anyway, great, great, great poem. 127, okay, first of the dark lady, of the specific dark lady poems. In the old age, you've got a gloss, you know, earlier times, black was not counted fair. Black wasn't thought to be beautiful. Or if it were, it bore not beauty's name. Notice what the speaker says. Maybe it was counted beautiful. But nobody said that. But now, notice, not the old times, is black beauties successive, that is, by succession, heredity, successive heir. Black is now, the speaker saying, what is called beauty. And beauty slandered with a bastard shame. Footnote, the former fair conception, white conception of beauty has been discredited as illegitimate and false. Now is the speaker saying that this is an idea or value held by society? Not necessarily. This is just the speaker saying this, okay? Lost my place. Line five. For since each hand hath put on nature's power, what does that mean? This, artificial beauty. 
you've got some kind of skin defect. You can cover it up. Okay? For since each hand hath put on nature's power, fairing the fowl with art's false borrowed face. Sweet beauty hath no name, no holy bower, but is profaned, if not, lives in disgrace. And I think what the speaker is suggesting there is that the old conception of beauty is what is slandered with all of this stuff. And what is really being gotten at is one's beauty at birth by how one is born. Because if you imagine for a second, the image, for example, of Queen Elizabeth that's in the portrait in your book, Imagine Queen Elizabeth as not, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, but an Ethiopian queen. Very dark skinned. How easy is it going to be to make her that white that is in the almost impossible? So what he's suggesting is you can take anyone according to that old conception of beauty and kind of make them fair, so to speak. Um, Tweet beauty hath no name, no holy bower, but is profane if not lives in disgrace. Therefore, turn, summation almost, but it comes before the couplet, my mistress's eyes are raven black. See, the old conception is her eyes are like lights. Not just because of the shooting out the eye beams, but they're, they draw one in. Her eyes so suited... Her eyes are suited to being black. Suited meaning apparelled, colored, like clothes put on. And they mourners seem at such who, not born fair, no beauty lack. That is, her eyes, my beauty's eyes, are like mourners, right? Because black is the color of mourning. Because they what? They look at those who are not born fair, meaning fair complected. Those who are born darkly complected, they what? They don't lack any beauty. Now bear in mind, again, the idea, where does beauty reside? It's, it's not just a phrase from the 19th century. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. If my beauty's eyes are black, what does my, the person being addressed, see through? Have any of you read Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Minister's Black Veil? Read that little short story. A preacher shows up to church one morning and he has a black veil on. Okay, so imagine this is black. Covers everything down to his mouth. Scares the bejeebies out of everybody. He never takes it off. From that morning, he's like 30 years old. Until, he, until he's dead. His fiance says, take it off one time. He goes, nope, not going to happen. And he explains, this is an emblem. It is a sign. It typifies something. And on his deathbed, I'll give it away, on his deathbed, he says, when someone says, take it off, he says, no, I look around me and I see a black veil on every face. Well, the black veil symbolizes secret sin. Not just all secret sins, but the one sin you say to God, God, you can have all these other sins of mine, but this one, I'm keeping this one. This one, ooh, I like this one. This is a good one. You can have all those. Just let me have this, all right? Because he's seeing through, what? The darkened veil, everything he sees is darkened. The implication is seeing through black eyes, what? Everything this person sees doesn't lack beauty. Why? Because beauty is no longer fair. Beauty is darkened. Sees everything darkened. Slandering creation, no beauty like slandering creation with a false esteem. That's those not 
born fair. The not born fair doesn't only mean not born white complected. Because bear in mind, fair also means what? Beautiful. Those who aren't born beautiful, they do what? They slander creation with false beauty by putting on makeup or today plastic surgery. Nothing I hate more than an actor or actress who had been handsome or beautiful when they were 20s, 30s, and 40s, and they try to retain that into their 60s or 70s, and they look like they've got a plastic mask on, and they're always like this, you know, so much plastic and Botox. Yet so they mourn. What's the they? The eyes. They mourn. Becoming of their woe. That is, being fit, being meek, being appropriate of their woe, their sorrow. Why? That every tongue says beauty should look so. The eyes are mourning. Why? Because all the other tongues out there, they say beauty should be what? Okay. Go from there. Skip 129 for a moment to 130. And then we'll come back to 129. Am I reading too, in, too far into this in line 10 and 127 where it says the eyes go through their... Because that would be like a like slit. Like slit, S-O-O-T. No, um, suited it's like... like clo slash. No, it's just like clothing. In, in, in attire. Your gloss uh, tells you in attire. Being so suited, um, being so dressed in darkness. I mean, no, well, I mean, I see what you're getting at. Possibly the color of soot. Yeah. 130. Sting, by the way, ripped this off for the title of a song and album back in 87, 88. It's a great song. It's a great album. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. So the other day, I described the blazon, the categorizing of the beloved's beauties. Okay. Well, Shakespeare gives us an anti-blazon because the blazon typically is typically Renaissance, blonde hair, white face, blue eyes, red lips, um, red cheeks, Perfect white, you know, orthodontically approved teeth, beautiful white breasts, etc. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Meaning, they don't shoot out gold light. Why? Sonnet 127. Her eyes are black. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why? Then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight, my absolute favorite line in all of Shakespeare, than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. Just love that line. It's so foul. Um, I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music can't the far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. So let's stop there. Where does coral grow? In the ocean. Where in the ocean? Right next to coastline. Sometimes coastline, reefs. Okay. Where? Next to Antarctica? Australia. Next to Aus uh, Iceland? Tropics. Primarily in the tropics. In other words, where the water's pretty warm. Okay. What would Shakespeare's experience of coral be? You think Shakespeare went scuba diving in the, you know, at St. Kitts for the summer? No. What happens to coral when you remove it from the ocean? It dies. it dies, first of all. And because it dies, what happens to it? It blanches. It loses its color. If you keep coral long enough, you can have a bright red piece of coral down in the ocean. You cut it off, you bring it out, you set it on a windowsill. Within a few years, it's white. It's lost all its color. My 
And coral is far more red than her lips red. Shakespeare's experience of coral would probably not have been a nice deep red. Maybe slightly pink. Okay. It's an anti-image. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. Done. What's dun colored? I should have worn one today. It dirty brown, dirty gray, like dirty dishwater. Yeah, you foul, you know. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have no idea what kind of wires they had in Shakespeare's day because they didn't have electricity, so what do they have wires for? But he's talking about a certain texture to her hair. And it's black, by the way. Roses damasked, you know, party colored, multicolored roses, part red, part white, petals and such. Hmm. No, I don't see those roses in her cheeks because of her complexion. And in some perfumes, is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks? Like garbage, you know, uh, fruit and vegetable garbage at the bottom of the trash can that's been there for a good week or so in 90 degree heat. Her voice is like, if you're familiar, familiar with the TV show, I never watched it, uh, the nanny from the 80s or 90s, Fran Drescher, the actress, who talks like this. Music has a far more pleasing sound. I never saw a goddess go. And he's taking a dig there <coughs> at all the other sonneteers. Notice, Astrophil and Stella. She's a star. A goddess. All right? He says, I've never seen a goddess. My mistress, when she walks, she treads on the ground. And that is usually, maybe not usually, that is often glossed to me. She's a street walker. A hooker. Okay? It also means what? She's real. My mistress is real. The mistresses these other sonneteers are writing about, they're what? Figments of their imagination. I don't mean real in the sense of Sonnet 130 is talking about Shakespeare's real physical mistress. Sonnet 130 is talking about the speaker's mistress being real and physical. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she be lied with false compare. My love is as rare, as unique, as original as any she from all these other sonnet sequences be lied with false compare. That is, they falsely compare her with goddesses. These other sonneteers do. Again, why is this speaker's lover rare? She's real. Okay. Now, little caveat to that interpretation. Amoretti by Sir Philip Sidney is to his wife. We know that. She was real. Okay. In that sonnet sequence, he refers to three Elizabeths. His wife named Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, and if I remember right, his mother, who was named Elizabeth. He kind of plays with that a little bit. Astrophil and Stella. Everybody reads that. I mean, everybody reads that. As Astrophil is Sir Philip Sidney. And Stella is Penelope Rich. Um, Penelope Devereux ne Rich. She gets married and takes on the name of her husband, Richard Rich. I think it's Richard Rich. Okay. Now I'll go back for one second to 129. I love this on it. The expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action. Lust in action. What's that mean? Lust being acted out. Lust being fulfilled. Notice, it is an expense of spirit in a waste, W-A-S-T-E. Obviously, there's what there? 
There's a pun, <clears throat> because that can also sound like W-A-I-S-T, a shameful waste. So how is lust in action an expensive spirit? Is there plus for that? Nope. It's one of those things. In the Renaissance, it was thought every time a man or woman had an orgasm, they died a little bit. A little, a little loss of spirit, okay? Which is why you'll see poets, and Dunn does this a lot, have things like, kill me, kill me again, kill me some more, etc. Dunn has one poem, talks about rising and falling and rising. I should go rising and falling, right, and falling, okay? I don't think I've, no, I don't have that one on the syllabus. <clears throat> so, spit the spirit, waste of shame, lust in action. Until action, that is until acted out, lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust, okay, or be trusted. Why? Because until it's performed, it's, it's, it's not real, okay? It's murderous of self, it's bloody, it's, you know, etc. Enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight. I always use this example. It's becoming harder and harder or less useful because not as many students have seen this movie anymore. Have you seen the movie Hitch? Will um, Smith and all the other characters? Remember, um, oh, what's her name? Eva Mendez's girlfriend, Kelly or Katie or something like that. And there's this hedge fund stockbroker guy trying to get her into bed. And he finally gets her into bed, and Hitch beats up with him and kicks him between the legs. And the guy's, you know, on the ground writhing. And he says, all this, anybody know the rest of the line? For a lousy lay. In other words, he's lusted, lusted, lusted after this one girl that he meets in a Victoria's Secret or something like that. And he finally gets her in bed, and he says... Enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight. Because lust is what? Why is lust, in one sense, so pleasurable? Where does it exist? Up here. It's like a dream. What happens when the dream is made real? It never lives up to the dream. It's not the ideal. Okay? Enjoyed no sooner, but despised it straight, past reason hunted. That is, you go beyond reason, you do stupid things to fulfill it, and no sooner had, past reason hated as a swallowed bait. You get what you think you want, and then what happens? You realize you got a hook in you. Okay? And it could be the reason you feel like you have a hook in you is because of something you picked up <laughs> from that liaison. On purpose laid, pun, <laughs> to make the taker mad. Notice the bait is purposely laid to make the taker, the person who's doing the taking, the person who's fulfilling the lust, mad, mad, how? What's mad mean in this context? Uh, crazy without reason. Crazy without reason. What could possibly happen through sex that causes one to become crazy or without reason? A venereal disease. Rampant in Shakespeare's day, by the way. Okay? And there's all kinds of poems and all kinds of other stuff written about that talk about or that allude to the various treatments that were used for venereal disease, like mercury, which we now know kills you pretty quickly. It also kills VD. So, you know, you have that going for you. At least you'll die without VD anymore. So, mad in pursuit, that is, crazy in pursuing it, 
and in possession. Crazy. Had, having, and in quest to have, extreme. You go to extremes to do all these. A bliss in proof. That is, in the act itself. Yeah, there's bliss there. Improved, gotten, taken, tried, attempted, all those things. A very woe. Before a joy proposed. And they proposed, they could echo, you know, will you marry me kind of proposed. I don't think necessarily it does. Behind, so before, before it's done, the deed is done, it's a joy proposed. Look at, behind, after the act is done, it's what? A dream. Why a dream? Dreams don't what? They're ephemeral. You wake up, you try to hold on to that dream, and within a couple hours, it's gone. Within a day or two, you usually don't remember it at all. All this, the speaker says, the world well knows. Notice, not just me, everybody knows this. Yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. Who's the speaker addressing men? Everybody knows everything I'm saying here is true, but none of us know it so well, that is, none of us take it so truly to do what? To lead us to say, Go away, foul woman. Go away, temptress. Go away, desire. Go away. Okay? So they just don't learn their lesson. They don't learn their lesson. It's, you know, you damned if you do, damned if you don't. Women, what do you do? You can't live with them, but you can't live without them either. <laughs> kind of a thing. Okay? So, question. Think of that sonnet here. Is this the speaker to the gold-haired youth? Is this the speaker, the, possibly, some, the way some people have read the sonnets, is that the speaker is older than this person, and he's trying to dispense advice, like, stay away from her. <laughs> She'll give you the pox. Because there is another sonnet where it's pretty clear. The dark lady does give the gold-haired youth a VD, okay? 135, uh, hold on a second. No, skip 135 for a moment and go to 138. This is the one I'm adding. This kind of goes back to, what is it, 93, 94? Yeah. <laughs> When my love swears that she <clears throat> is made of truth. So, pretty clear speaker talking about the dark lady. I do believe her, though I know she lies. That she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtle dyes. Okay, listen to that again. When my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her though I know she lies, that she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtle ties. Why does he believe her? What she just told us. To deceive her? Okay. To deceive her regarding what? Remember the scene with Sir Gallon and the lady? And she says, you know, you're not Sir Gallon. Because if you were really Sir Gallon, you would have talked to me about love. You know, because I'm so fair and innocent and untutored in that way. And Sir Gallon goes, <coughs> excuse me, you know more than 150 men about that art. In other words, I'm just taking my little baby steps around the block, and you've been running marathons around it, you know, for whatever. 
She might think me some untutored youth unlearned in the world's false subtleties. Why does he want her to think him an untutored youth? Oh, that he doesn't know much about life's factors. Keep going. And she does, so... So he's going to best hide with how good he is? Mm, no. <laughs> so that she can teach him. Tutor me. <laughs> in what? The world's false subtleties. Thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young. Who's doing the thinking? Vainly. Her or him? Vainly thinking that she thinks me young, although she knows my days are past the best. The vainly thinking is him. I will vainly think that she thinks I'm young, even though she knows I'm over the hill. She knows I'm not young. Probably, you know, the thinning hair, the paunchy eyes, you know. <clears throat> Simply, I credit her false speaking tongue. Simply, that is, I believe, I believe, I believe. I credit, I believe. That's what credit means. Literally, it means to believe. I believe her false speaking tongue. I know she's lying. Lying about what? Really? You're only 25 when he's 35? She's lying to him. He knows she's lying to him. And yet, he pretends to believe what she lies to him. On both sides, thus, is simple truth suppressed. I lie to you. You lie to me. All's fair in love and war, right? But... Volta, wherefore says she not, she is unjust? Wherefore says she not? Why does she not say that she is unjust? And wherefore say not I that I am old? Why doesn't she admit the truth? And why don't I admit the truth? Unjust probably means unfaithful. Why doesn't she admit that she's cheated on me? Yes, this is what's being talked about. She cheated on the speaker, probably with the golden-haired youth. Okay? you got to get all the other sonnets in, too, like 137, which is before this. Um, oh, love's best habit is in seeming. Trust. Seeming means appearance versus reality. Notice this isn't real trust. Sonnet 106 was about what? Real trust. Real love. Not, not moving if you move. This is Love's best habit is in seeming, pretending to trust and believe. In age and love, love's not to have years told. An older person in love or in matters of love doesn't like what? To have the years told. That is counted out. How do we know? I can't love you. You're old. You're foul. And you're of low birth, Sir Gowan says to the lovely lady. It's almost like he emphasizes the old part. The old woman says, stop. If you want me to be young and beautiful, but that's fantasy, this isn't. Therefore I lie with her and she with me, and in our faults by lies we flattered be. Notice the pun. I lie with her and I don't speak truths, and she lies. With me, she doesn't speak truths. And in our faults, our fractures, our lies, our divisions, we what? We're flattered. She talks to me like I'm young. I talk to her like she's beautiful. <laughs> we don't do it in here. Read sometime. Um, Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach. We never read it before. Kind of a dramatic monologue. 
about a guy who takes his girlfriend to Dover, and he's standing at the window looking out over the cliffs of Dover, across the English Channel, sees the twinkling lights of France and stuff, and he goes on this long riff in meditation, how life sucks and then you die. Talks about hearing the strains of Sophocles on the ocean coming in and out and in and out. And what does Sophocles say at the end of Oedipus the King? Count no man happy till he is dead, free of pain at last. Meanwhile, the girl's lying naked on the bed because he brought her down to the coast for the weekend. Then read Anthony Hecht's parody, The Dover Bitch, <laughs> written from the woman's perspective about, you know, he and I, we come down, and blah, 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 blah. I mean, the guy's voice is in there also. Yeah, we hook up every few years. You know, she's getting kind of fat, but she still puts out, and we have some fun. And, you know, I buy her this expensive French, you know, perfume and such. Okay? He turns it completely on its head. They're both lying to each other in Heck's version. In Arnold's version, Arnold uses this tryst to become a meditation on the total, utter nihilism of life. I mean, actually, it is. There is no such thing as love. There is no such thing as truth. There is no such thing as loyalty, honesty, beauty. Hey, but let's pretend, the speaker says. Let's have sex anyways. It'll be more than sex, but it won't really. Okay? Um, 138. Now go back briefly to 135. We're not going to take it all apart because it'll take way too long. Shakespeare's punning on the word slash name will. And the word will, multiple meanings. Volition, sexual desire, sexual organs, and obviously, the name. Okay? Whoever hath her wish, thou hast thy will. Wish, no matter what other women may wish for or attain, whoever hath, whatever woman has her wish, you, specific person being addressed, you have your will. Gloss, three. In Shakespeare's time, the word could also refer to sexual desire and even to the genitals. Well, it also means just simple desire. You have whatever your desire, your volition is fulfilled. You have your sexual desire, you have your sexual organs fulfilled, and you have me, <laughs> will. In will to boot, and will in overplus. Capitalized, probably indicating just the name. Right? More than enough am I that vex thee still. Remember the other day I mentioned, you know, there's this medieval Renaissance commonplace that women cannot be sexually satisfied by one man? Okay? He's saying, honey, when you had me, you had all men. You don't need any more. Okay? More than enough am I to thy sweet will. Probably this one, and maybe this one. Two or three uh, definitions, two or three. To thy sweet will making addition thus. Let me add mine to yours. Wilt thou whose will is large and spacious, and that's why they can't be satisfied by one man, because their will, organ, is opening. It's a hole. It can't be filled, so to speak. My line shall will in others seem right, uh, excuse me, not once not safe to hide my will in thine. Okay? Have sex with me. Shall will in others seem right gracious, that is kind of like better, and in my will no fair acceptance shine? Why will you take another's will but not mine? The speaker is saying. The sea, what? All water yet receives rain still. Yeah, that's true. And in abundance addeth to his store. So, in other words, oh, we have a simile. So, 
thou, being rich in will, capitalized, and being capitalized definitely refers to the name, but probably here in this context refers to the other three meanings. Being rich in will, add to thy, because notice now it's still capitalized, but that's not referring to his name. It's to your will, one will of mine to make thy large will more. To make her will enlarge. Might be saying, let's get you pregnant. Let no unkind or unkindness, no fear beseechers kill. Think all but one, that is, think all wills. Your gloss says suitors. Yeah, he's not speaking only about the full package. He's talking about a specific part of the, he's the package, you know. Think all but one in me in that one will. Now, you can read this, I think, almost, almost like a companion to number 98. Where he says what? We've been separated. And you're the flower. You're the greatest. You're the rose. You're the lily. But, you know, there's all these other flowers around here. And while I was away from you, cat's away. (laughs) Mouse is going to play. But they were all just images of you. Here, the speaker is saying what? Baby, you had me. You don't need any. All men are found in me. Macrocosm, microcosm idea. All right? Um, I've got 144. What time is it? 922. Two loves I have of comfort and despair, which, like two spirits, do suggest me still. Two spirits. Bugs Bunny, Warner Brothers cartoons. Little angel on the right shoulder, little devil on the left shoulder. The better angel is a man right fair. Golden-haired youth. The worser spirit, a woman colored ill. Dark lady. To win me soon to hell, my female evil tempteth my better angel from my side. And there it's made explicit. She has taken him from him. And would corrupt my saint to be a devil, wooing his purity with her foul pride. And whether that my angel be turned fiend, suspect I may yet not directly tell. Go back to those sonnets where the speaker says, I look in your face and all I see is love. But, (laughs) supposing like a deceived husband, thou art true. In here, the speaker thinks, you've been false to me. False to me how? Sleeping with her. Is that because the speaker and the gold-haired youth are sleeping together? I don't think so. A lot of critics do. Wooing his purity... The speaker says, and she's ruined him with her pride, whether that my angel be turned fiend, suspect I may, yet not directly tell. But being both from me, both to each friend. Notice, they only know each other how? Because of him. They're friends now, seemingly because this guy stupidly introduced them. I guess one angel in another's hell. Him in her hell. Why? Think of the expense of spirit and a waste of shame. Men know this, but they do not know how to shun that hell. I think that sonnet is, you dummy, I told you, I warned you, stay away from her. Yet this shall I ne'er know. I don't have proof. But live in doubt till my bad angel fire my good one up. And look at your gloss. Until she 
kicks him out. And then you also have ultimate to drive something or something away from a place by setting fire. Possibly the fire fever with perhaps a glancing reference to venereal disease. <coughs> Once he gets the pox, <laughs> he realizes he warned me. <laughs> she gave it to me. Okay, can't believe we finished those. Done with Shakespeare sonnets. Tuesday, next week, Johnson. Read all the poems for Johnson. Read all the sonnets that are assigned. But we'll focus on quickly on my first daughter, on my first son. They both die. <laughs> and then to the memory of my beloved, the author, Shakespeare, etc. Okay. Have a good weekend. The exam is due Monday night, I believe. 16th? Or is that Sunday night? That's Sunday night.